went to a party, um, it was like late, late 1982. There was local parties in certain neighborhoods. They would have bands play and charge whatever, five bucks to get in and have a keg of beer and just come in there and hang out and watch local band play cover songs in a backyard instead of in a bar. And um, Chuck just happened to be there and we just struck up conversation coincidentally and had a lot of the same musical influence and stuff like that. So uh, me and Cam dropped out of high school first, pretty much the same time. And then Chuck dropped out a week or two later. And then we pretty much spent seven days a week, you know, in his garage. <laughs> Everybody heard the music because when he started the band, Mantis, it started coming from the garage. And we were trying, my parents were trying to figure out ways to soundproof the garage and everything else. All the way up, way away, you could hear the, actually, you could feel the vibration of the drums and stuff. <laughs> you know? Chuck had a really great infrastructure in terms of his in support from his mom, Jane and she allowed him to follow his dream to be a, a musician, no matter where it took him. Whether that meant bailing him out of Canada when things didn't work out with the Slaughter lineup and helping him get back home, or whether that meant putting up people who were moving halfway across the country to join his band or jam with him. They were pretty much, there were times they would come over for dinner, and it was always a family dinner, and mom would say, oh, what's going on? Well, where are you staying? Oh, no, come stay with us that kind of thing. And um, that was after my son Frank had passed away. Mm -hmm. So to me, that, that was great. You know, they were all about the same age, and it was, it was great. They were wonderful, wonderful kids. Kids, now they're, they're grown men and all, but back then. She believed in, in, in him as an artist. And I think that considering the art that he was uh, writing and performing at that time, that's a pretty sizable leap of faith because I think most parents would just be like, what is this shit that you're doing? It was never like that with her. It was always complete support and love for Chuck, and not to exclude his dad as well. His dad probably tolerated it you know, more than loved what he was doing. both had a mutual friend that went to school with me. So one day, this guy, he invited me to come over to his house and listen to some records, you know? So I went over to David's house that afternoon, you know, wearing my cutoff jean jacket, my Iron Maiden shirt or whatever, you know? And, you know, we each got an armful of albums, you know? And eventually, Chuck came over. He's wearing his cutoff jean jacket, and we're all wearing our cutoff jean jackets. That was like standard issue back then. And on the back of his cutoff jean jacket, he had this drawing on the back of it, this crazy, you know, evil looking creature. It said Mantis across the top of it, you know? And then along the bottom it said Florida's original death metal band. You know, at that point I hadn't heard Possessed. But I asked him about it, I'm like, what's that? And he's like, oh, that's my band, Mantis. We're Florida's original death metal band. <laughs> he said it just like it was written across the, the bottom <laughs> of the jacket. And I was like, cool, death metal, right on. Okay, I haven't heard of that yet. <laughs> I just, I was lucky and found out about underground metal. Just by chance, there was a record shop that carried Metal Forces, you know, and I got the second issue with Dio on the cover. <laughs> you know the one. You didn't have access to this stuff otherwise. There was no other way to get it. These records or these recordings were in stores. You only really had the major label stuff and maybe a couple independents, Metal Blade, the early Roadrunner stuff, you know, loudness and stuff. But, you know, there was way more out there. And because of the groundwork that No Life Till Leather had created and this network that had it had created globally, you had a lot of hardcore fans. And people would have, like, catalogs of what all demos they owned, you know? And it, it could be, like, a whole photo album full of just titles of demos and, and live shows and stuff like that. And just fill up, a, like, a 90-minute tape with however many demos or shows you could squeeze on there. And then go and scribble out a track listing, find a package, get to a post office and mail it, cross your fingers that it got there, and hope that whoever you sent that tape to would be cool enough to send you something back.
And I didn't realize until Frank, the mailman, said, Jane, I'm a little worried about Chuck. And I said, why? He said, well, look at this, you know? It was addressed to death and stuff. And I said, he's doing all that in his room. And I remember that Chuck in his bedroom had all of these envelopes and he would be on the phone and sometimes with really big phone bills to my parents, talking to people and trading tapes back and forth. So I thought that was really cool that they were making their own music and sharing it and spreading the music. And that's how a lot of these bands, you know, became popular. You know, be able to put a jam box down and hit record with the tape player outside the garage with a towel over top of it, and it sounds okay. It's where people can listen to it. And they would play for hours, practice for hours, all day Saturday, all day Sunday. So basically, you couldn't go in your own house on Saturday and Sunday. And um, one day he comes in, he had a box of cassettes, and they were death cassettes. And he had like a stack of t-shirts, and he's like, Freddie, would you mind? I want to put my music in your store. Would you mind selling it, consignment? So I said, yeah, absolutely, I'd love to. It was like not maybe a day or two had passed. I called Chuck, and I'm like, Chuck, hey, it's Freddie. And, and right away, he's like, oh, dude, you don't want to carry my, my product. I said, no, man, I sold out of your cassette and the shirt. <laughs> So uh, a friend of mine works for a uh, small radio station in our area, and uh, she came up to me one day and said, hey, this guy is uh, looking for new members for his band called Death. And I was just thinking to myself, there's no way it's the same band and the same guy because I'm already into this. So I said, yeah, give me the phone number. Let me call it. And um, I talked on the phone, you know, like you try to you know, feel things out. You know, I was I was kind of worried because I was only 17 at the time. So I'm like, yeah, I like artillery and I like Sada, Slayer or whatever. And he played me um, some riffs. He's like, yeah, let me show you these riffs I got. It's this song called Scream Bloody Gore. I was like, oh, that's a good title. Mm -hmm. You know, it's to the point. I got the Sadus uh, DTP demo, Death Deposers. I'm like, oh, okay, local band, cool. And this, they're fucking badass, you know, that tape is a screamer. And the phone rings, and one of the guys says, man, you're not going to believe this, but there's a guy on the phone saying they play in a band called Death. And we're like, yeah. The name's not too serious because it was too, you know, too obvious. And, uh, well, it was no big deal because they said they got the demo and they liked it and they wanted to hang out. So we're like, all right. You know, let's see what these guys are all about. So the whole band, Sadis, actually piled in their car and they came over to my house. They just showed up and... I met the band Death, which was two guys. This uh, funny accented guy from Florida and a young skinny dude that was still in high school. They all had like matching denim uh, vests or jackets and they looked like a fucking gang, you know? And um, we went and we hung out, you know, smoke joints or whatever. And we were, you know, we were fans of Rush and Maiden and everything. Everybody's got the big kit. And during the day, we would go to where they practiced. And Chris has a big, shiny white drum kit. John was looking at that like, man, that's great, you know, killer. You do a lot of stuff on that set. And then when, when Death would come over to, to our practice house, you know, they were really digging our situation in the room we had. And so the deal was made pretty easy, you know. It's like Chris said, man, if you guys let us come here and practice, I'll leave my kit set up. And and told John, you could play it. And John was like, oh, wow, cool. And they had all these new toys, you know. And At that point, Chuck was still living in Antioch with this lady who was managing the band. And she found this little studio. And we rented a bass, because we didn't own a bass, because it was just me and him. We couldn't find band members, ironically. It wouldn't be like that nowadays. I remember being super happy with how it came out. It's, you know, it's pretty crushing. It just evolved out of five different demos uh, until uh, April of 86. We recorded our fifth demo and we got signed finally to Combat Records. And originally they had a, a series they did of bands that they were kind of like afraid to take a chance on where they put out a record with like a plain white sleeve 
in like a camouflage, you know, a sticker on the record. And that's what they wanted to do, Combat. And somehow she talked them into turning it into a proper record deal. And Combat um, trusted us to find a studio to record in, which turned out to be a big mistake. So what happened was Chuck wanted to go back to Florida. And I actually went along and stayed for the summer of 86. And we looked through the phone book. OK, there's a studio in Orlando. And uh, we talked to a guy named Otto. And we were explaining our vision, you know, and he just gave us the, the blank look, like, I have no idea what you're talking about, but I'll record your band. You know, we might have been just talking Klingon to him. It would have been the same thing. So anyways, we start recording. And I remember the first thing that was weird is like, you know how you, you, you know, tone down drum heads by putting, you know, pads or like tape on them or something. He stuck a fucking maxi pad on my floor, Tom. I'm like, I don't like this. <laughs> you know, that's not what I would do. And I have to look at this thing every time I hit the drum. So fuck. So we got through, I think, seven songs and uh, Combat had to listen and they said no. So they just wrote off that first session as a mistake and um, book time in Los Angeles with Randy Burns. And that was insane for us. We're like, yeah, we worked with fucking Randy Burns, you know? He... The key to Scream Buddy Gore sounding the way it does is Randy Burns. Randy had experience recording heavy thrash. So he was able to have some kind of frame of reference and didn't like throw his arms up like, what are you guys trying to do here? It was like, all right, this is what you want to do? Got it, let's do it. That made all the difference in the world. Or what death metal would be defined by Scream Bloody Gore is at ground zero because it was the first record that was released on a record label that had a legitimate release because prior to that you could not go into the into a record store and buy a death metal record. It didn't just come out, it kind of started everything. It didn't, I mean, like, you know, I know that people say it was either Possessed Seven Churches or, or Death Screen Bloody Gore. But listening to the performance of Screen Bloody Gore in comparison to Possessed, I felt like Seven Churches was kind of sloppy. And then you'll, you know, you hear Screen Bloody Gore and it's tight and the songs are really well produced and sounds great. We were sitting in in Chuck's apartment and the test pressings arrived with two pieces of cardboard cut out with the vinyl in between it. And I guess somewhere in transit, the temperature got to him and it got warped. I mean, playable, but warped. And I thought it would be a good idea <laughs> to set the test pressing out in the sun and let it become soft and then kind of like flatten it again. And we're sitting there, it's almost like, waiting for a cake to come out of that. But finally, we just put it on a turntable. I remember we put the needle on, and the and the, the waves, the lumps in the vinyl are going by, and the needle's flying. A couple times, it got thrown off the record. <laughs> it just it just turned into this thing, just wah, 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 and it was, like, completely unplayable then. That was a major thing, you know, like, I did, I'm, I'm on vinyl, you know, while I'm 18, this is an accomplishment. And I think they only gave us one, because Chuck was living with me, and I fucking ruined it, you know, so. Steve did learn the set, and we uh, we jammed with him in the Satis jam room. And we had plans for shows. We even had we started to draw the flyers with the Death and Satis logo. You know, we had the set ready to go and all that. And then Chuck said, "Hey, I'm gonna go back to Florida and you know visit my folks and whatever, go home for a while." And then some some time went by. Well, actually, I think quite a bit of time went by, like a few months, because I filled in with a band called Desecration for a while. So I didn't want to I didn't want to get involved in another like full time band, because as far as I was concerned, I could be in death still. And then uh, Chuck finally said, hey, dude, I'm, I'm here to stay. I don't want to come back to California, you know. And so, you know, I was bummed, you know, I'm like, oh, well, that sucks, you know, but OK. You know, and he's like, well, if you want to come move out here, you know, we'll just keep on it and, you know, get some other members. And 
and uh, you know, just keep moving forward. Massacre did a tour of the East Coast. We came home from that tour and- um, We were supposed to open for Megadeth and Overkill at the Armory in Tampa. And we got to the show and we're, we're told we weren't gonna play. Megadeth management had one of their other bands come in. Massacre was kicked off the bill. Well, at that same show, some guy came up to Rick and said, hey, Chuck's in town. He moved back to Orlando. So a few days after that, Rick, he you know, went to Chuck's house. Without calling him or anything, and you know, I'm showing up at the guy's house. He doesn't have a freaking clue why I'm here. So I just said, hey, man, you know, this is what's going on. If you have any interest, give me a call. Mm -hmm. So he called me the next day, and um, I called Bill and Terry, and they were really excited. And... We, we learned a few songs, and we got together and, and jammed. It may have literally been three or four weeks that we were together. <clears throat> the first show was in Milwaukee Metal Fest. I remember actually on the flight going to Milwaukee, going over each song, like, okay, because that's how fresh the songs were in my mind. The United States back then, they really didn't have these uh, three-day festivals. And Death was one of the bands on there. And uh, they were, um, I guess, somewhere like in the afternoon. I remember being in the McDonald's next door to the Eagles Auditorium, which is where this place was at, and these kids were talking about the mutilation demo. You know, these kids, they were just normal kids just like me, and they were like, they couldn't wait to see death, and they were talking about the mutilation demo. Jack had been in contact with someone at Combat who said, we have this new act, and their record had only been out a short time. And I heard the record literally just one or two songs and didn't pay much attention to it. So I stood in front of the stage and I watched all these other standard thrash and metal bands play. And then when Death came on, I mean, there was a sort of a, an anticipation. And I remember when Death played, one thing I remember about Chuck was just, he would kind of stand kind of stiff, kind of still. And when he'd open his mouth for one of those big screams, his tongue would stick out a little bit and he'd just like emit this like, you know. <laughs> I was uh, backstage meeting people, talking to people, and I eventually made my way over and introduced myself, said, you know, my name is Eric Greif, I'm, I'm a manager, promoter dude, and I live here in Milwaukee. He had a card that said death on it and had an address and uh, for giving out to people that he tape traded with. And I got in contact with him. And that was like their first real tour where they came up that far and played shows on the way and on the way back. We started rehearsing more and more after that Milwaukee Metal Fest. And when word came down that we had a tour lined up, we'd already started writing new songs. And you know, Chuck was presenting the songs at practice. Hey, check out these riffs. A couple of songs Chuck had already completely mapped out and had them already written, you know. Mm -hmm. He would just play and Bill would put beats to them. We actually started playing a few of the songs from Leprosy on the Scream Bloody Gore tour we did. We had already had two or three of those songs. I got a call from Dan saying I got this record to do. They call it Death Metal, it's the band Death. Can Scott, your assistant, can he do the record with me? Because I always worked with Dan with the sabotage and stuff like that. And then I also went and uh, Scott asked me, can you help me set the mix up right? So I, I went in and started the mix. But for me, Chuck and I were just telling jokes to each other while I was doing it, and then Scott had to do all the hard work. And when I heard the, when the final mix at the time I heard, I thought it was amazing. You know, now when I listen back to it, the drums are hair loud, blah, 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 whatever. But I thought at the time it was just like the most amazing thing I'd ever heard in my life. But it was my first time in a studio. It was all new to me. The other guys had been in the studio recording an album or demos. I had Scott Burns staring at me, Rick, Chuck, Bill looking at me, you know, the producer looking at me, it's like, come on, you know. <laughs> he was a nervous wreck. It's not like he can't play the songs, he played them on tour. He played them at rehearsal. So I was kind of thrown in the fire on that. And uh, I basically had like an anxiety, anxiety attack, panic attack in the studio. So I just asked Chuck, hey dude, you know, to save time and money, can you do the bass, you know? 
And at the time, there was no problem at all. We didn't, nothing was even said about it, really. Chuck's like, yeah, dude, you know, I did the bass on Screamer to Gore, I can, you know, it's no problem. I was, I was in, in, living in the dorms at the time, University of Iowa, and my roommate and my dorm partners, that, you know, the other guys who lived in the hall, uh, were pretty used to the metal that I would play fairly loudly at the time th throughout the day. And I remember getting leprosy and playing it full blast. It just it, it made people aghast. What is this music? It just was like so obscene to ears that have never heard anything like this. <laughs> What really kind of hits in 88 is the grindcore movement, like Napalm Death released their second record, Carcass releases their first record, Earache continues to grow and crank out records. And all that stuff was kind of starting to bubble in the underground. So Leprosy came in and seemed to have uh, a few more peers in, in its you know, weird little like extreme world. You know, productions were getting slicker. Slayer had South of Heaven, Metallica came out with Injustice for All. Boy Vod were maturing. The first Sanctuary album, Fate's Warnings No Exit, came out. That was a pretty big album at the time. They're very dry. They're very sort of clean albums. Leprosy was just total, still just total ferocity and brutality and dirt, um, but yet it was being conveyed really well. The recording was really great. When he was writing, he had hooks in mind. Even his early back is like, Pull the Plug or Born Dead. Like, Remember the vocals. You remember the riff, but you remember the hook. There were choruses in those songs that people came back to. And at the end of the day, in spite of all the early brutality, in spite of all the later progressiveness, I think at its core, he just wanted to write good songs. It was just super heavy, but also technical, but, but catchy. It was memorable. And I think that's what Chuck took from all of the bands that he admired is a lot of these bands that, that he really looked up to and loved to listen to, they just wrote really good songs and really kind of catchy songs. And you can be the heaviest band in the world, but you can still write a hook and write a, a catchy song. We didn't have a booking agent at the time. Scott, who was a good friend of ours that actually worked at the label, he's like, hey, there's a tour if you want it. It's you guys and Dark Angel. So two of the five acts that were in the video would tour together, and it sounded like a great idea on paper. Combat, our record label, they mentioned to death, to Chuck or somebody, that it's equal billing, meaning that um, in the ads, on the posters, on the gig flyers. You're gonna have Dark Angel and you're gonna have Death right next to it. Equal billing. That does not mean co-headlining. So we started butting heads over it. The wording was just simply that Death would be billed at the same percentage of space or whatever. Clearly Dark Angel was more well-known than Death and had an album out more than, than Death did. It was implied that Dark Angel really was the headliner. You know, to me, I'm like, whatever. We're on tour, promoting our album. Sure enough, somewhere around Milwaukee or Utah or somewhere, that was it, you know? I just remember an incident over drum risers. And they wanted Bill to set up in front of the riser and Gene to set up on the riser, and everyone was rolling their eyes. His demands were starting to get rather um, cockamamie when Chuck uh, probably for the 10th time, said, we're leaving the tour. This time our tour manager said, go ahead. You know, if you don't want to be here, we don't want to keep you here. So they turned around from wherever they were, uh, you know, Buttville, Montana, or you know, whatever, and went home. Again, you know, we first time in Europe, which seemed like, you know, we all wanted to get to Europe so bad. When we got there, it seemed like, 
it was just an alien world to us, you know. You know. Equipment was in one van, we were in another van traveling. I think the van was driven by the promoter's wife, and he would just get on the phone and be like, I, you know, I'm gonna die. We got hotels every night, which, whatever, we were sleeping, there was no problem. But um, after about halfway through that tour, again, Chuck's like, you know, I had enough of this. So we quit the tour and came home. Yeah, that was kind of the, the the pattern was when I was in Milwaukee trying to run things for death in my office. A lot of the time I felt like I needed to physically be there. They would rehearse in Chuck's mom's garage in Altamont Springs, and that was three and a half hour drive. So we would, uh, you know, load into my Wagoneer and go to his house, watch the band rehearse. Right at the tail end before Rick was released from the band, we actually started working on one of the songs that was on Spiritual Healing. I think it may have been the song Spiritual Healing. Legion of Doom, which was one of our first songs, other than the, we had a song called Mantis. Legion of Doom uh, riff, he was on Spiritual Healing. I was on the road, coming from New York, heading back to Milwaukee, but I didn't go the normal way that I would, which was south of the Great Lakes and you know straight across on the interstate. I actually went through Toronto because I wanted to go to the Relativity office. And it was in Toronto that I was at a payphone and talked to Chuck and Chuck said, I've been thinking about it and I want to get rid of Rick. And so, I phoned Rick right away from that same payphone. Eric had given me a call. I was in New Jersey at the time. And um, uh, Chuck called me first and asked me if I had my guitar. And I lied. And I said yes, but I didn't. Because I knew why he was asking me that. You know, I'm out hanging out. I'm not practicing this and that. Da, da, da. Rick was very gentlemanly. It was almost as if he knew the call was going to come. Now, I don't know if he sensed that. Chuck was going in a new direction. I assumed that's why I was let go. So I know he was looking to broaden his horizons and it's just, it was his thing, you know what I mean? So I have no, I'm not gonna fight the guy. He's not gonna help me stay in the band any better. For Chuck, I think his vision was always evolving. And part of the problem was that the people that he needed to execute it at one point in the band aren't the same people that he needs to execute that vision at another point in the band. And so we had this tour of Mexico that we had to do, and we were without the second guitar player. So we had, you know, been going up there, so there was this kind of relationship, and he knew we had a certain ability on our instruments. He could see we were very serious about practicing our instruments and getting better. And so Paul kind of was the first call to, you know, when they were having problems. I met Paul and he had to learn the songs and, and all of that. I sat next to him on the plane uh, going to Mexico City and the entire time I was trying to convince him to join death, but he would not do it. He said, no. He said, I've got cynic. I had to respect that. I just had to finally give up. And then when we had the pandemonium at the tour of, of a kind of death mania, I, I would have thought that that would have been enough for anybody to want to join the band. He had a record deal, he would have just walked in, but he just said no. So we had to go to plan B. I had met James at a club in Tampa. So uh, when time came to uh, Try and look for another guitar player. I recommended James. I knew he was a shredder. James is a very keen sense of melody in terms of guitar solos. There really wasn't anybody else who played like James on death metal records to that point. He just had a, just like this great, great feel for how a, a solo should be. And it really worked for where death was going with the new material. So this was the right guy to bring on at the right time. The first 
taste of death that I got would have been 1990. It would have been spiritual healing. I was 15 then, and I was a fan of like heavy metal. Like I liked stuff like Metallica or Iron Maiden or Def Leppard or whatever. And I had a friend of mine who was uh, infinitely more adventurous than I was, and he acquired uh, spiritual healing and Beneath the Remains, and um, he basically played them for me. And I recoiled in horror. I was just like, I don't know how anybody can be into this. This is just like, this is crazy. Oh, do you really like this? It's like, and, and so I retreated to, you know, uh, <laughs> and justice for all or whatever. Alter in the future. And spiritual healing was just a little bit less heralded because it was the third one. It wasn't anything new anymore. Yet, he was still taking it into new areas. It was just as powerful, I think, as the first two albums lyrically because he was it was horror, but it was real horror. It was stuff that was actually happening and these, these awful things. Death is a band that I can put my personal outlook on certain things in life into. And I think it means a lot more when you're singing about something other people can relate to. That's why you don't hear death singing about uh, demons uh, flying down and, and plucking uh, nuns from the earth. You know, that's idiotic. That's putting a limit on people's... So I think Pull the Plug might have been the gateway to what happened on Spiritual Healing. Because Pull the Plug you could look at as maybe him wondering about, you know, assisted suicide or, you know, uh, being kept alive artificially. And that obviously has real life connotation. James and Chuck started clashing a bit. I think it was just egos a little bit, you know? James is a good friend of mine, but he was a bit quirky, you know? And at times it might rub people raw. I mean, it had been building up between him and Chuck yeah. for the whole tour, you know, and, and um, Chuck just snapped and said, that's it, you're out of the band. Uh, unfortunately, James rode home with one of the opening bands, Devastation. They stayed with us the whole time. He didn't fly home. He stayed on the tour, you know. We came home for a couple months, and we actually started writing songs for Human, mm -hmm. and we were to go to Europe. Walt Tranchler was our sound man. We had known him for years. He had run sound for us. Called him up, said, hey, we're fixing to do a tour. We need a lead guitar player. Are you interested? And he said, yes. So Walt drove from Texas. He stopped by Chuck's house. Uh, Merciful Fate was blasting through the stereo. Someone was vacuuming. Walt's knocking on the door. No one's answering. He sees someone peek out of the blinds. Then the music turns off. No one would answer the door. So uh, he calls me. Hey, what's up with Chuck, you know? I can't, he won't open the door. I said, dude, come to my house. There's a bunch of, you know, crap going on, you know. He really dreaded getting on that plane and going to Europe. And he was also going through a period of fatigue with keeping a personal life going. His pets, his family, his girlfriend. And at that point in time, we were in a litigation with each other. He never said anything to us about what was going on. He never... I mean, it seemed like everything was all right, you know? But the thing with Chuck is, was, if he turns his back on something, over time it will go away. A couple tours have been canceled in the past. You know, same thing. Cancel a tour, lay low for a couple months, and then everything smooths out. But we had signed contracts, and we had all this stuff laid out already. Merch was already made. Uh, techs were already hired from creator. You know, there's a lot on the line. So I called the booking agent. The booking agent called Chuck's mom. She was Chuck's power of attorney. And basically what we worked out stated that, you know, Chuck wasn't going to Europe for the tour. He didn't want any part of it and he wasn't gonna be held responsible for it. So me, Bill and Walt drove to Orlando and uh, Chuck had signed the paper. We signed the paper, everyone got a copy and that was that. And so they left and they got Louie and they got Walter. And then I got a call from my lawyer. You're never going to guess who just called me. Look, they were young. And I think that everybody had their points and everybody had their feelings. At first, Chuck was angry about it. But I think as, you know, the days wore on, I think that, that he was more thoughtful and pensive about it. 
And then it turned into, instead of anger, more of a sadness about it. You know, death touring and I'm in Florida is just a really incredible um, concept, you know, in general. And, uh, you know, it depressed me at certain times and I try to get over there at one point and it's just not a very good situation. There's a lot of, uh, you know, bad things going on out there as far as, you know, feelings towards me in general. And uh, so, you know, I didn't make it out there, unfortunately. I wanted to, but never did. About three or four weeks into the into the tour, Chuck called the, the, the booking agent in TCI that was in New York, represented us and told him, you know, he his head was a little more clear now and he, he felt like he could go on tour. He wanted to be part of the tour and, and, and Mitch, Carduna from TCI told him, dude, you cannot go. They'll, <laughs> yeah. And he couldn't understand that. That's my band. He's like, well, contractually, through the label, they're two thirds of the band over right now, you know? I mean, that's just the way it is. And, you know, creator don't want you over there, you know, just because of what happened, you know? You know, I was with Bill and Terry for quite a while. And uh, we were definitely more than just band members. We were best friends. So that's also another factor that's really drag when you lose members. Sometimes friendship is involved. And we knew at that point when we did that tour that, okay, we're not in death anymore. You know, we're fulfilling this tour and this contract and all this as death. But we, we knew that when we came home, obviously that was it. But if he had just talked to us, you know, we, you know, we would have talked to him and maybe, you know, we could have tried to work something out. I want to just keep moving forward and then have a record each time around where people can say, wow, you know, that's a lot uh, different in a way from their last album, but still be the same. You know what I mean? Yeah. Have a fresh approach, but at the same time, have it where someone can put it on and they can say that's death, except a lot better. Therefore, you're not getting the same death album twice, and you, you never did. Yeah. And he continued on this kind of path. That path led to a lot of fallouts with musicians he was working with, mm -hmm. and he got a reputation for being difficult to work with. I think it was more just having this solid creative eye, this vision that was not going to waver for anybody or anything, mm -hmm. and that's how you get to a, a record like Human. So when Sadis, we were actually sharing a bus with Obituary, and, uh, and we were both support bands for Sepultura. This was November of 1990. We came through Florida. And Chuck came to town to the venue in Orlando early in the day and invited all four Sadist guys to his place. And we just went and killed the day just hanging out, watching Watchtower videos on his TV and made some good food, you know, and just hung out there. He had told us that some previous guys had kind of, they had a falling out and they went on tour without him under the name Death. And he was ready to just start over with a completely new lineup. Well, at the moment, you know, I'm working on new material. I've got half the record down right now. Um, I got friends of mine from the band Cynic, you know, the drummer Sean and guitar player Paul are helping me out, rehearsing, they're, you know, going to help me out in the studio, and so it's really great. And then I guess when he started having problems with his lineups, or I'm not even really exactly sure what the reason was, um, you know, he asked Paul if he thought that I would, you know, be interested in, in doing the record. So when... <clears throat> A, I got the call from Chuck and was like, of course, you know, and then it was going to be like, well, how, is he going to want me to, it's going to be interesting. What is he going to want? And so to me, that was exciting news. You know, I'm a friend of Chuck, fan of his music, I'm a fan of Cynic, and I'm picturing this union. And as the tour progresses, we get up to Milwaukee, I think, and where Greif was kind of part of this Milwaukee Metal Fest. And the headliner was Sepultura, and then Obituary was on that tour, and then, of course, Sadis. And... Steve just walked in and I just said, hey, hippie. Congratulations, you're going to be on the next death record or something. I'm like, what? <laughs> so I think I found a payphone and called Chuck and he goes, oh, yeah, I was going to ask you. He had worked on some of the human songs with Terry ahead of the split. So some of the material was already written and recorded, like demos of these songs. So to give these songs to these jazzy cats from Miami was incredible because it came together in a way that was totally fresh. 
I mean, look at that leap. Chuck was advancing to a point where he needed guys like Sean Reinhardt, who were listening to Chick Corea and, and you know, Mahavishnu Orchestra and all these kind of fusion bands. They understood that language. They were studying that stuff. And they were well into death metal as well. I think what human became was because of the players themselves, is the style of the playing, is that Reinhardt is all over the place, so no matter what, he would have been presented a song that Bill had done Bill's way, and then he just said, okay, well, this is how I play. <laughs> That was the point of him, you know, bringing in a guy like Sean Reiner, who's, I mean, Cynic's already way different than, you know, a lot of the, you know, Obituary, D-Side, Morbid Angel bands that were really established. You know, he was looking for a departure. So he was looking for musicians that were bringing a different angle. Obviously, it comes in with context of what death is supposed to sound like. We're yeah. not going to go in there and play something ridiculous. But as long as it didn't stray too much from the heaviness and the aggressiveness that, you know, that death should be, of course, all the little nuances on each instrument were up to us. I was so nervous. I was so nervous. It was my first real, like, legitimate record recording session. I just remember, like, losing sleep, like, the week before that. I mean, and we had been rehearsing this. We had cut demos. We came pretty prepared for Human. We had a, we had a, some time we used the cynic warehouse down in miami to work out chuck's ideas and even add our own ideas so we came pretty prepared so it was easy going and we got in we got tones in one day and i finished that record in like two and a half days and we had like eight days for drums and we were left with like six days left with drums on the schedule and they were like so we wrote cosmic c i mean we had worked on vacant planets but that we had written that in the rehearsal room we wrote Cosmic C in the studio. I've always been writing my material without a bass player in some way or some form. So with me and the Georgia, we just, you know, going for it. We were just breaking shit down. Oh, we can do this here and we can do this here. And and it was easy with Sean because, you know, he had a completely different approach to it. You know, he was he was playing the beat, but it was almost like polyrhythmic to what the riffs were. And so that opens up this huge gap between the guitar riff and the drums for the bass to just cruise back and forth between everything, between the melody and the, the rhythm. You know, we, we spent quite a considerable amount of time on that stuff. So it was a little bit of a disappointment when the mixes came, came out and he was kind of buried. And, because there was a lot of stuff that was matched up with me and him, you know what I mean? I think that had an influence on other people starting to play at the time, and it made them want to stretch and become Sean Reinhardt on the drums, or be a Steve DiGiorgio and be very fluid, you know? And he brought almost a jazz fusion element into the playing that really kind of fit with metal. It's got a flow that I think spoke to a lot of metal fans, so, so you, I think you had an immediate outgrowth of a lot of musicians and bands uh, forming in the wake of Human, none of the other Death albums really sparked that kind of desire or that ambition to play in that way. Because there were other death metal records that I picked up first, like I, I caused a death by Obituary was the first death metal record that I seriously got that was pure death metal that just like changed changed things for me and then it was a few months later i ended up getting death human 
that was the first death record that connected with me. Because again, I'm 16 at the time. Death metal is just blowing up. And when I first heard Human and kind of saw, I mean, like back then it was CDs and cassettes. Um, so uh, when I first saw the artwork in comparison to stuff like, you know, Cannibal Corpse, Tomb of the Mutilated, it's, it's I mean, it's... <laughs> It's just more far out there and it's one of the things that i really loved about that record at that time too because you know you'll have like you know uh, morbid angel blessed are the sick and then there's human where it's just really kind of like different it were at the time it was different when, when you brought in sean and paul and steve they had so many different backgrounds between the three of them you know musical interests and musical tastes i mean it still had that you know, that basic raw aggression in it. There was just so much more to it, I think. You know what I mean? So many more textures. Something like human is, seems more extreme to me than spiritual healing or even leprosy. Even though technically it's less barbaric and not nearly as heavy in, in that, that old school traditional sense, but this idea of pushing stuff and stuff being more... That's what resonated with me, and that was something that was like, this is different. This is something that I'm into. And from there on, I was like, I was just like, I was a, I was a full-on death fan from that moment on. It changed a lot of people's conceptions of death metal. It made them understand that it could be expanded and played around with quite a bit, and new influence could be brought into it, and not water it down necessarily. It's still very much a death metal record. It's just a very kind of death metal operating on a higher level. Death metal kind of evolved from this weird little thing in the late 80s to by around 1991, 1992, this movement that had multiple bands that were selling hundreds of thousands of records. There were um, real media outlets like even MTV and um, uh, you know, covering these bands, like getting real attention. So we just, like everybody else, thought we have to do a video. This is important to us now. And we went to Relativity and we just said, we need a video. That's what's happening right now. And I distinctly remember uh, being like 16, sitting in my bedroom and having like an old VHS uh, uh, cassette in my, my VCR, like waiting when the triple thrash threat would start to hit record so I could get like this like four minute video of death somewhere. Like, you know, You'd hope, oh, maybe they're going to play it this week. So you'd sit there and try to get it. But I know that I certainly was not the only person who saw that video. And it really kind of exposed them to a wider audience. idea of turning on the television and seeing yourself was just so far removed from our brain. Like we couldn't even imagine that the band Death would be on TV. And Headbangers Ball was the really only opportunity by that time for metal. To, this is even before Beavis and Butthead. It's just, this was it.
I knew the director because I was managing a band called London in, uh, from, from Los Angeles. And uh, we had done a video for one of their songs, and this guy, Dave Bellino, had been the director, and I liked his work. So I just said, would you do this one? And he just said, yeah. <laughs> a one camera shoot, one camera. So I played that song something like 30 times, I think. And of course, I have to like at least move most of it, you know what I mean? Well, actually, in a video situation such as this, well, this is how we do it in LA. I don't know about Orlando, you know, that's different. How shit. much do we put? We're usually just, you know, run through the song about 30 or 40 times, do individual, we call them ISOs, isolations. I was living in Kansas when I was growing up, and I saw the video for Lack of Comprehension on Headbangers Ball. I was just totally blown away, especially by Sean Reiner. There's a shot where he's playing like this, and he, and he looks like an octopus playing this crazy drum pattern. I was like, whoa, what the heck is that? And for me, being a drummer, it sounded like, you know, Neil Peart crossed with uh, Pete Sandoval, it was just the craziest thing. But what became striking was the European metal press writing about the fact that Chuck had an inability to follow through with tours. And that became a problem. I think maybe we get the unconvenient stuff out of the way first. Yeah, yeah. it's okay. So let's, 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 let's talk about the European disaster, right? Yeah. So why, why didn't you make it to Europe? What is, what is the reason behind it? They knew that he had bailed towards the end of a tour. And so we're thinking, you know, this guy doesn't want to be out there. And now there's another tour with Creator. And rumors were that Chuck wasn't going to show. And then when he didn't show, that was it. It was very difficult going back to Europe with Human. Nobody believed that it was going to occur, really. And all I can do is say, I'm looking forward to making it to Europe finally. And I hope people show up and, you know, support the music. And, you know, that's, that's about it. I mean, you, you know that um, a lot of people um, are fed up with the band right now. Right in Germany, there's a lot of people pissed off. So you got to win them back somehow. Yeah. So will this band make it to Europe at last? You sure? Yeah? Exactly. What if, what, what if not? What if not? And come back in another life as an acorn <laughs> and that would suck <laughs> seriously and i said to him okay so how do you want to work this and he said well i would like to buy everybody new instruments we'll use the equipment for the north american tour and then we'll ship it to europe and use it i'm like what why do you want to ship it because it's our equipment and and i want to work with our my own stuff and we'll get transformers so they can be plugged in and what am i supposed to say i just all right it's going to be crazy and so because we had nothing left, I had to do a deal so that the bus would be fronted by the British promoter who had the British dates that we were doing at the end. And, you know, Paul and I's first tour, you know, we got the bus, the whole thing. I mean, you know, we've driven vans and RVs and, you know, we were just loving it. And back then, man, your tours were long. And they were like two months at a time. By then, Chuck was growing really homesick. It had been two weeks out, and he really wanted to go home. And then we got sick. And we were all sharing a bus, and they were French band, and they all smoked, and our bus driver smoked. 
So we were traveling literally in just a 40 foot fucking secondhand smoke capsule. And Reiner collapses. He gets very, very sick, has to be brought to the hospital. Then I, being a diabetic and not paying attention to my health, I got sick. And then Eric had to go to a hospital, and then that's when it fell apart. So I stayed, and the idea was I would keep in touch by phone from the venues. Something happened when Chuck got to Germany where he flipped his lid about the promoter and something relating to the gigs. And by then, of course, he was at wit's end because he did not want to be out. And the next thing I know, I'm fired for not being by his side, and he's quit, and the tour is over. <laughs> I remember Barzo vote, you know, threatening Chuck with lawsuits, and um, it was definitely, it, it was just a weird situation because, you know, we were totally caught in the middle of that thing, you know what I mean? And because the bus was put up, the money for that was put up by the British promoter who hadn't had his shows yet, they were at the end of the tour, he flipped out because he lost all this money, so he put a lien on the gear. Our gear got taken, so my drums, Paul's guitar amps, and, and, Pre and Mike Pree's and all that shit were held hostage. And we were now signed and supposed to, you know, write and record a record, and we, it took us like nine months to get our gear back. And he gathered the guys together, and somehow they made it back to London for the flights back home, because, of course, the flights were from London two months later. So they had to negotiate their way to get back on their plane. And it was Chuck saying Eric, and Eric saying Chuck, and the bus company saying the entity death. And then that's where everybody, you know, it kind of turned into Lord of the Flies. You know what I mean? Everybody just like didn't know who to trust and it turned into this whole weird situation. And um, well, we cut it off two weeks early, actually. We did six weeks of touring. And then uh, the financial part of things completely fell apart due to uh, people mismanaging uh, our funds, things not being paid, a lot of things. It was a nightmare financially. Tour-wise, is great. The audiences were great. People were really, um, you know, they accepted things. And it's it fantastic on that mm -hmm. level. But financially, it's a disaster. And you cannot tour without funds. Mm -hmm. You know, we do not make millions. This is not a big, big, big money-making thing. Any notion of us sitting at a table and having a discussion before the tour about what we need to do if you want all your gear sent to Europe and not that we don't just rent stuff, all of that went down the drain. And someone had to be blamed, and so he just, it was very convenient to blame the manager. I, I never had any resolution with Chuck, Chuck unfortunately. And I never really had a... a big fallout with Chuck, interestingly enough. I never got the phone call. I got a phone call from Steve DiGiorgio saying, hey, dude, we're in the studio right now and Gene's playing drums, you know. The only thing I'm upset about is just not the communication, you know. Hearing it from somebody, from somebody when they're in the studio, was just like, really? Just call me, dude. You know, you, I understand you have a timeline. You're, in a, you're a professional. You know, you, this is your, you're, you're living. I'm not going to be angry. I'll be disappointed. But um, so anyway, that's a whole other part of that thing. But um. um, the whole lineup uh, went on to uh, do their band, which they still had together at the time uh, when they were helping me out. And uh, so they're doing their thing now. And um, that meant I needed to start looking for new people. And luckily, that wasn't any problem. I lucked out and got a hold of Gene, formerly of Dark Angel, and I uh, called him up, and he was into jamming out. And uh, That was rather strange. You know, um, I, I was in the process of leaving Dark Angel when I got a call from Boy one morning saying, hey, man, Chuck is, you know, looking for a drummer. And I, I talked to Chuck earlier, and, you know, I brought your name up. You know, whatever happened, I called Chuck a day later or whatever, and I... I Said, hey man, you know, Borboy called me and said that you're, you're looking. He's like, yeah, are you interested? And it, you know, it was it was completely just like, we picked up our last awesome conversation. You know, we just kind of picked it up from there, and everything was great. And 
Um, within, you know, a couple of weeks or a month, I was in Florida and we were rehearsing in his mom's garage at that time. And uh, Scott came up from Tampa and he bought Chuck a little four track, you know, just like, <laughs> hey, you know, this, you're not going to record your demos on, on a ghetto blaster again, you know, here, taught us how to work it. And then to top it off, I got Steve uh, back jamming again. Uh, he's taking time from Sadis right now, who are still together, you know. And uh, so uh, it's it's been fantastic. And we got Andy LaRock from King Diamond to come down and, and do some lead work. So you know, this is Andy LaRock from King Diamond coming in. You know, this this is the man. And Chuck had picked the songs he wanted Andy solos on, but instead of sending him the whole song, he just recorded the little segments where the solos go. So Andy said he received this tape and it was just these little blurbs of music and he just, he was kind of, he wasn't really locked in. He's, he was out of context, you know, he didn't, he didn't have the vibe of the song. He didn't know the whole mood. He just had these little parts. Chuck was like, here's where you play. And Andy's like, ah, I'm not feeling it. So he had showed up and said, yeah, I didn't, I listened to the tape, but I didn't really, I didn't really listen to it. I didn't sit down and, and analyze it. I didn't really prepare something. And Scott was like, oh no, here we go. You know, this guy, comes all the way in from Sweden and he's just, you know, and we, he was only scheduled for a couple of days, really. And he's like, how are we going to get this done? This is brutal. We're going to have to start from square one. And he just looked over me and Chuck and shrugged and he said, don't worry about it, guys. You know, it'll be OK. Just push record. We'll see what happens. And Scott takes a big sigh. All right, here we go. Hits record. Boom. And he lets something rip. <laughs> Chuck are just freaking hair standing up, goose bumping up, watching this guy in action. We get to the end of it, and then he's like, kind of laughed, like, oh, well, I'm just getting warmed up. Give me another run through. You know, let me let me do something for real. And Scott goes, hold on, let me set you up another track. I'm keeping that. <laughs> I don't know if he really prepared at home and just kind of played it off, or if that's just what comes out of that guy, but whatever it was, it was awesome, because he was knocking his solos out. And not only just playing a cool melodic solo passage with very, very few takes, but as soon as he would finish a take and we all got the nod around the room, like, that's it, that's it. He would say, roll it back to the top and give me another track. And he would double it, note for note, inflection for inflection, and was just nailing what he just did, like in a harmony position or something. And it was like, holy crap. I don't ever try to control what people play. I just said, come in and let loose, let the metal flow. And that's exactly what happened. And it's great to be able to get people that you know, that you're friends with, and that are really, uh, professional and strong at what they do and have their own identity and that is crucial within any type of music. You have to have your own style, whether you play piano or whatever, you know. He had made it clear during the recordings, I think he even made it official one day, we just went out for lunch. It was something like, hey, we've been offered like, you know, a two or three week run over in Europe and might you be available for it? It's a festival thing that we're headlining. We weren't expected to in the recording to go out live but he said, you know, I'd really like to have you guys there. Are you willing to do it? And, you know, we just looked at each other like, hell yeah. You know, this go out and play this material we just helped invent. You know, that would be great. Death will always remain a growing band because I think there's definitely too much of a limit being put on death metal right now with uh, this big rise in the satanic stuff and, and just brutal lyrics for the sake of being brutal rather than putting some thought into and trying to conquer what people already think of heavy metal and, and death metal or hard rock in general. So I feel like uh, I won't put a, a limit on this and I want to keep continuing grow, to grow as a musician and as a person in life and to try to put into the music what I learned, so to speak. I think he made it clear that the scene the death metal scene in and of itself was was for a lot of people really kind of a limiting box to be in. 
you know, like it was always be more extreme, be more extreme, be brutal, be this, do the sickest stuff ever. And I think he didn't want to do that anymore. And I think he realized that like, you know, where do you go? Like, you can't just keep, can't just keep pounding out those kinds of, those kinds of lyrics all the time. And if you're not, if your heart isn't in it, you don't want to, you don't want to fake your way through it. So for him, I feel like it would be pretty natural for him to kind of react negatively to the, the idea that he was just a death metal guy. It was, and you saw him do that. You know, obviously he said it in interviews at the time, but like he would kind of like go against the grain, I think really in, in like really, I think fun ways, especially with like the t-shirts that he wore that shirt that he wore in a headbangers ball interview where he's got the cats, the little kitties on them. Like stuff like that was always like, you know, nobody else would do that. Nobody else had the balls to do that. And it was just basically, it was, it was, it was fun, but I think it was also like, I think it was also kind of a fuck you, you know, like you don't have to be this brutal all the time. And like, what is the point of it? And really, are we all really this brutal all the time? Is this really how life is? Now, on the other hand, death went out in like what appears to be like a pretty high budget video. Actually, it's very budgeted. Uh, Doesn't, where, did you, where did you film the video? We filmed it actually, part of it was outside in some natural springs in Florida. And uh, the other half was shot two hours away in some warehouse in the middle of uh, tornado land. Because uh, looking at the video, I mean, it looks like it was like in some rainforest or something. You went and spent all the money on it and it's a nice video. Thank you. We're very happy with how it turned out, definitely. <laughs> Is this a joke? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think this is supposed to be funny. <laughs> hey, check it out. It's Jeremy. Yeah. <laughs> He's still running. Who would have guessed they would be cultural tastemakers? But if you got Beavis and Butthead to comment on your video, you were getting a lot of extra eyes on it in primetime television. Because like it or not, the Headbangers Balls audience was still pretty limited to midnight to 2 a.m. on the East Coast on a Saturday night. So anybody who stayed up was already indoctrinated. You know, you were already into this shit and you were waiting for it. If you're watching Beavis and Butthead and you got hit with, you know, 40 seconds of a death video, that that could hit anybody at any point in time. I, I mean, was it spawned out of like a love for the music that was being played? I don't know, um, but they ripped everyone apart, no matter how good the music is. I mean, White Zombie, oh, Crowbar. Sucks. I mean, Crowbar are one of my favorite bands, and they just totally ripped them apart. But I mean, like, it, the, it then becomes a part of the mainstream when you have such a popular show like Beavis and Butthead featuring death. And the fact that Chuck's only real job was in a Del Taco when he was a teenager, I mean, I, I think that's classic. Yeah! <laughs> I think I saw this dude in Burger World once. <laughs> yeah. That was pretty good, Beavis. You suck almost as much as this dude. the stories of the previous cycles and I think me and Gene had kind of committed to each other to kind of you know preempt that as much as we could like whatever was in our power just as as Chuck's buddies but I think there were a few times that some stressful moment would come up I don't know if Chuck was having family issues at home or maybe there was some kind of bullshit with management whatever the fact when he would get that tense kind of you know irritated like almost ready to do something, whatever that may be, you know, me and Gene would step in with a calm voice and just assure him we're there, we want to finish, you know, we want to trudge on. And I think sometimes it pulled Chuck back in because we were able to finish all the dates and everything. And Individual Thought Patterns was an angry record. 
angry lyrically because he was just, that was how he got out his aggression at a very volatile time for him. Um, and a time when we were at odds with our partnership. A lot of the new lyrics reflect that what comes around goes around type attitude. You know, I am set in my ways. I'm going to continue doing what I do. It's what I enjoy and what I know best, you know, how to do. If I didn't do this, I don't know what I do. Maybe I'd be a cook. I like cooking. <laughs> you know, that's pretty limited, so. He put a lot of meaning. There was some stuff. If you read between the lines, he had a, it was a way for him to express himself, and he was honest about stuff, but he was a whole lot bigger than his music. It's obvious. He was a complex guy. Everybody knows that, you know? I don't think he'd ever try. He wouldn't try to take things out. It wasn't like he was personally attacking people. It wasn't like that. He was a little, he was wound a little tighter than most people, so I think sometimes when those stress issues came up, it really, I mean, he was right on his last coil and it just got to him. So we would see times where he would drift into that mode, but I think a combination of having maybe guys that would determine, like me and Gene were, you know, coming, trying to bring, bring an air of calm to the, to the environment. Plus, I think it was, uh, Chuck was maturing too. We were all getting older. I think he was able to kind of control himself too. So it just seemed to, go a little smoother that year. When symbolic songs were being written, I was gonna be in the lineup for that, and I was called to Florida to work on the new song ideas with him and Gene. Yeah, I, I essentially moved into Chuck's place for a long time, him, myself, and Steve DiGiorgio. We had an eight track recorder now, which is still not a lot of tracks, but um, I remember we, we there was no way we were gonna get a decent drum sound to make demos. It just wasn't gonna happen. So we would work out the songs, we'd play them, and I had my drum machine with me, but what I did is I just took my drum machine. Everything that we play in the afternoon, I'd spend hours at night replicating on the drum machine. And we'd have a great sounding demo where I'm in the drum machine, I am playing exactly what I'm playing live. And I recorded the demo version of the song, and then my first kid was being born, and Chuck was in a really determined, busy mode, and I wasn't able to commit the time, so I wasn't able to finish Symbolic. I can only speak to the guy that I knew really well. And uh, I know the guy I worked with was really fun to be around and really artistically creative. It was our first record together, but we'd known each other for probably seven or eight years before that because he'd been working with Scott. So we'd see each other in the hallway and go out to lunch and hang out. When he first came to me to said, would you do the record? I said, if you really want to do this, let's do it right. Let's put, let's leave no stone unturned. So he was very excited about doing it. He, was, he had no trepidations about doing it. He just wanted to make sure that we, we didn't just say, okay, that's good enough. It was, uh, it was always, no, is that good enough? Yes, it's good enough. Okay, let's try harder. Let's do even more. And Chuck really wanting to make a big step forward on the record uh, all at the same time. He kind of wanted to break his, his own mold a little bit. There, there was no hiatus going on. There just wasn't a lot of live activity. I know there was Voodoo Club and then Voodoo Cult. But I did know that Chuck was like, yeah, I just did some project with some guy. Valdemar Sorikta, he, he produced a lot of the early Century Media records, uh, and he was also in Grip Inc. I think that was his project mostly. It, it was kind of this, one of, an earlier super group. He didn't have a lot of metal super groups at that time, and that was one of the first ones, but it didn't, it didn't have a US release. I don't believe it did. Um, you can only get it on import here, and it just didn't do that well. And I remember listening to it and thinking, well, it's too bad. All these great guys on one record, and it's just not that great. 
when I eventually did end up getting a call from him to see if I would be interested in auditioning, um, he we remembered that day, we remembered that afternoon. We actually had a mutual friend. You know, John worked at this store called Guitars Plus, which was in downtown Orlando. And he just called my house and left a message. Bobby, pick up the phone. Bobby, pick up the phone. God damn it, Bobby. <laughs> Why aren't you home? So we kind of had that guitar spot still open, okay. um, which we were looking for a permanent player. And we found uh, Bobby Cobley, okay. who's an excellent guitar player. Okay. And uh, he plays really from his heart and soul, which is very important. You know, we need to keep things running smoothly, and uh, we need to have the right people in the band. And yeah. this, I feel, is a very good band right now. It's excellent. You know, and so I got home and I heard it. I'm like, you <laughs> suck. I obviously called him back. He was like, dude, do you remember that afternoon at David's place? And I was like, yeah, man, I remember that. He's like, yeah, that was awesome, right? And I was like, yeah, cool. <laughs> Symbolic Chuck's riffs were starting to really explore his love of 80s power metal. It's like he, he went back 10 years and, and really started, you know, letting his metal flow. And he wanted to really inject more of a melodic content into death metal, which is somewhat of a dichotomy there, right? But, uh, but he really wanted to do it. So if you listen to Symbolic and listen for the guitar parts, there's a giant leap forward to my ear in the melody content of the guitar parts. Maybe again, some of that was through that appreciation for more power metal structures and vocals and things like that. He was able to take those influences and translate them into something, not necessarily even more commercial, but something more relatable to, to a lot of different people. I think there's a chunky, sort of heavier, direct element to symbolic that we hadn't heard since spiritual, really. Um, I think Chuck started to bring in some of the riffs, bring in some of the arrangements, make it maybe a little more memorable. I think, yeah. I think that just came from his influence of listening to more mainstream metal acts or even hard rock acts. It's, it's well known that he was a fan of Queensryche and all kinds of different bands. He wasn't just a brutal uh, metal guy, only listening to brutal music. It was far from it, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and that, but he brought some of those elements, and, but he did it his own way. I think the song structure, certainly in Symbolic, was more had more metal in it and not not so much brutality, although it was still brutal, but in a different way. You know what I mean? Almost even the way he sang the songs, you could almost, he, he, he seemed to pronounce the words clear, more clear. There's a stealthy melodic content to his vocal. He wanted to take melodies and go. He wanted to really drive that direction. How do you put more melody into his music? Well, you can't do it with the guitars. He's already really, really melodic. So the vocals is the next piece. And then I heard him sing, and I'm like, oh my god, you can sing. You're great at doing this. You can sing metal stuff, any kind of metal stuff. And he said, yeah, but I don't like to sing when I'm playing guitar, so I have to have a singer. I still wish I could have recorded Chuck actually doing the vocals. I had like another version of the record, but that was never done. I think that the last couple records in particular, Symbolic and um, The Sound of Perseverance, are records that I think they were lost to a, a generation of early death metal fans. And I think people only kind of began to rediscover them as time went on. Because clearly he wasn't kind of, you know, doing the usual death metal thing. He wasn't sticking to the stereotype. He wasn't playing with all the usual tropes of death metal. He was always moving forward. And, and I think by the time Symbolic had come out, there really wasn't that much, uh, great happening in death metal at the time anyway, so naturally he would want to distance himself a little bit from that. And uh, again, Chuck just wanted death to be a really, really super heavy metal band. And that's it, nothing more or less. Um, it's just that he's, he was ensnared by his band's name and his band's logo. You can't get away from that. Right, it's a pretty brutal name, definitely. Uh, at the time, I wanted something you know extreme, something brutal, shocking to go along with the music, you know, and uh, now I would probably call it something different, but it's kind of stuck with us. I think the name definitely hinders the band to a certain point, but at the same time, people really dig it, and hopefully they just take it as a name describing the sound that we started with. If you had a like a, a Jeff Tate type vocalist, a vocalist that would grasp the invisible orange, Chuck, that was Chuck's action right there. You know, he, he would complain constantly about like, fuck. 
I wish I didn't have to sing on this music. You know, I wish I had a real singer doing this because then I'd be really happy. But it wouldn't be deaf. Roadrunner would flip, right? If suddenly Chuck sang and, you know, Chuck could sing. They would have flipped because they were expecting death. And the fans were expecting death. So what the heck is Chuck supposed to do? So in his mind, he invented Control Denied at that point. I was going to be more of a melodic project with him just playing guitar with a different singer. And he was just kind of like, dude, I don't want to deal with this anymore. You know, just. He just wanted to do something bigger. He felt like the death metal thing had kind of been done really, really well by him and other guys up to that. And he wanted to say, let's do the next thing. Let's go farther. I don't know if that's something that a lot of people realize, but yeah, Death was actually over as a band after the Symbolic Toys. At that point in time, Chuck's relationship with Roadrunner had pretty much gone south. People were getting boxed in. It became like really, really a stiff genre, which is exactly backwards from the way it got invented. The original death metal stuff was, let's be outrageous, do new stuff, be totally different. And then a few years later, be totally different as long as it's exactly this, and just one little thing. Don't go outside of that. Well, you don't say that to Chuck Schulman. Don't do a thing different. Would not work too well with Chuck. This is not a death of power. This is not a game to be lost to one that does death be done. We were in Europe for about probably you know, maybe five or six weeks or something, maybe four weeks. And a, a Symbolic was just coming out at that time. Um, I remember after or during after one show, um, we got the latest whatever huge magazine in Europe it was. The back cover was a Symbolic ad, and it had four other albums from four different death metal bands. And this is when Chuck was really trying to get away from that tag, you know, just flat out. It's what he was trying to do. He didn't want to be called death metal. And he called the record label screaming, raging at him. I told you not to do this. I told you not to do this. Fuck you. I would rather break up my band than work for you anymore. And a few days later, um, I, had, I had done something to piss him off. And I had really never done anything to piss him off before, but he got pissed at this. And then the last 10 days of the tour were just absolute misery, you know? We were touring with the English band Benediction. Mm -hmm. And we had a night off from the tour, but Benediction had a gig that night, and it was somewhere in Germany. And so we ended up going to the gig, and we just parked outside, but we didn't do the gig. Benediction did the gig. So anyway, Benediction was like, oh, you got to come up and play a song. You got to come up and play a song. It's like, all right, well, whatever, you know, we'll see what happens. Anyway, Chuck stayed on the bus. You know, Brian, bass player Brian, Gene, and I ended up going inside and checking out the Benediction gig, and there were, like, five people in there in the audience. There was nobody there. I mean, there was, like, literally, like, five fans standing in front of the stage, and then aside from that, it was just the staff of the place. So, you know, we're just kicking back, having a couple beers, watching the show. And all of a sudden, Benediction is like, we're going to have some musicians in death come up and play a song. You know, so me and Brian are just kind of looking at each other like, OK, what's going to happen? And Gene started getting up on stage. So it's like, OK, I guess we're on. So we went up and we got up there and we're like, Kakanka, we're standing around. We didn't know what the we didn't know what to play. You know what I mean? We're just kind of standing there looking at each other. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? And it's kind of like, well, come on. You know, Gene's like, come on, let's play something. And I'm like, I didn't. what are we going to do? It's like, OK, Chuck's nowhere to be found. I'm like. Let's play Zombie Ritual, all right, in front of these five German fans, you know? And our sound guy, Paul, happened to be hanging out there. And who's going to sing it? I don't know. Who's going to sing it? Paul, can you sing Zombie Ritual? And Paul's kind of like, well, OK, I guess. So he got up there, grabbed the mic, and we plowed through Zombie Ritual. And Paul was up there singing it and just kind of having fun with it. Anyway, we did it, and that was that. We all thought it was harmless. Well, Chuck found out about it, and he wasn't very happy about it. The next day, he kind of sat us all down. He's like, you know what? That was really not cool and disrespectful. And basically, you know, you shouldn't have done that. <laughs> you know, very strongly worded, you know. And no one else really said anything, you know. So I just, I, for whatever reason, I decided to speak up. I'm like, Chuck, you know, we really didn't mean anything by it. It really wasn't that big of a deal. There was no one in the club. And he's like, 
you know what, man? It's like, you're conjuring a dick. <laughs> I'll never forget that phrase. It echoes in my head all the time ever since then, man. You're conjuring a dick. He's like, I set you up, I take care of you guys, and you go out and you disrespect me and my music like that. It's like, you're conjuring a dick. The last 10 days were just, you know, they weren't fun. They were a real challenge to get through. We got through it. And that's the thing, you know, when Chuck broke up the band, when he said, I'm, this is it, we're done after this, I was like, now I don't have to quit. Because I was quitting after Symbolic because we had started working on what was going to become the Sound of Perseverance. And I wasn't super satisfied myself with the direction things were going. I was dreading it because I was like, man, I'm really going to let him down. You know, he's probably happy to have a relatively solid lineup together and probably thinks this is going to go on for a long time. And he had told me something like uh, they had prepared all these Control Denied demos. They had the lineup. They had the logo. They were, it was a full band. They were ready to move on to the next step. That was to get a budget from a record company and get signed and do it, you know, the, the real way. And uh, The labels didn't want to gamble with Control Denied. They didn't want to gamble with him changing the name and changing the plan because death was an established thing. You know, and they wanted to uh, invest in something that they knew was more solid and they had a better idea of what it was going to do. Signs with Nuclear Blast, they're the savior. They're going to be so fantastic. They're my new label. Uh, but they said, we'll do a Control Denied record, but we want more, one more death record. In other words, uh, Bite the Pain, Spirit Crusher, A Story to Tell, Voice of the Soul, and A Moment of Clarity. All five were originally Control Denied songs. We had recorded those as demo versions, and then Chuck had put some clean vocals on, on a couple of those, and, and we were auditioning different singers with those. When I got to Metal Maniacs in 97, it was as a fan of Chuck and Death. I had nothing to do with him. And then suddenly, um, Borovoy Cregan, who now runs Blabbermouth, he was uh, the news columnist for Maniacs at the time. Um, he wrote something about Control Denied that Chuck didn't like. It sort of intimated that um, Control Denied was being put on ice because he couldn't find a record deal and he was reviving Death. And he even intimated that Death was going to be using some of these controlled denied riffs. And Borovoy and Chuck's relationship up to that point had been a little bit strained already. So Chuck took that very personally, thought Borovoy was slagging him or, or making, you know, kind of cutting him down a little bit. Um, and I got the heat on that because I printed what Borovoy said without checking with Chuck. And Chuck came to me directly. I think I got a call one day. It was Chuck, you know, before a caller ID or whatever. And um, we talked. And by the end of the conversation, he understood that I'm totally on his side. I'm, I'm a total fan. And that, you know, I don't think, I tried to tell him that I don't think Borovoy wrote anything all that negative. He's just reporting. But since those songs were complete and it was a last minute deal because they, you know, they wanted to push for that album, for another death album, and they wanted us to go do that Dynamo Festival headline with Pantera. And when I heard that, I was like, <laughs> It can't even be real because the Dynamo Festival is massive and Dynamo is the third live show I'd ever played with the band and it's in front of about 40,000 people. Much opportunity to 
to really even rehearse for, for that whole first leg of that tour. The lineup started getting a lot tighter near the end of it, you know, around the time we got to Chile and the shows were getting a lot better because we were a lot tighter as a unit. <laughs> It wasn't too long after we finished the American tour for Sound of Perseverance that we started working on recording the Control the Night album. And I helped Chuck move um, from his house in Orlando out to his farmhouse where he had his home studio. And we were moving some heavy cabinets and things like that. And I kind of remember, you know, a little bit after that, he had some soreness and I thought, he was stressed out. We talked about it a lot. And both of us thought that the issues he was having, the tension he was feeling in his neck and stuff was because of tension. Yeah, he told me early on, he told me when he was, he had like a pain in his neck or something. He said that he had asked me if I was familiar with acupuncture. And I was like, no, I have no idea. He said he was going to a chiropractor to fix the pain in his neck. It wasn't doing anything. So. I can't remember what they did for him. Uh, they probably made some adjustments, which did nothing, obviously. Um, then he went to an acupuncturist, and from what I understand, she put uh, one needle in the back of his neck and went like this and said, go get an MRI. It was on his birthday, and uh, the doctor told him he had a brain tumor. Yeah, I remember that day like it was yesterday. And he picked me up early from high school, which was strange. And uh, it was my grandfather and Chuck in Chuck's van. And my grandfather was driving. And Chuck's like, I got some bad news. I'm, I'm really sick. And I, I remember kind of being horrified because I had just not even given a thought to something like that. I mean, you don't even know how to respond or react when, when your best friend tells you that they have cancer. And it was just devastating. They went into the studio to do the Control Denied record, and apparently it was a kind of a bad session. And he called me and he made a cassette copy, mailed it to me, and said, will you play on the album? So I called him and I said, oh, sure, I'd love to, you know, because I keep getting called back. And uh, when he sent me that tape, I told him I'd like to listen to it for a few weeks and absorb it and really get into it. And he's like, no, I need you to come tomorrow. Like, this is already overdue, so we don't have any time to spare. You need to get here and just get it recorded. And so I said, okay, well, I'll come straight to your house. Just, we'll just go over everything. Just push play, sit there and jam with it, and I'll just learn it. It's, I'll just, you know, crash course, learn as fast as I can. He says, okay. So the day, the next day comes, and he calls me, and he says, you all set to come? I said, yep. He goes, well, I'll tell you what, I'm not going to be here when you get here. I need to go up to New York for radiation. Oh, okay. That's heavy on, in two places. Obviously, the first one being, wow, you're going to get radiation. But then I said, well, like, what am I going to do? Like, you know, I heard this stuff like a day ago, and I need to record all eight songs. So he says, well, Shannon will help you out. Okay. It, it happened fairly, fairly fast. I mean, by the time we finished the album, uh, he was already in New York when Steve flew here and I was showing Steve all, this, all of the songs and we went over there to do his bass tracks. Uh, at that point, Chuck was actually in New York at NYU being operated on. Hey, Me and Jim, would, we would take a couple minute break from playing, we'd sit there and we'd just go, this is unbelievable. We had his number where he was staying up there. Mm -hmm. And we talked to him several times every day and played him parts of songs for him to kind of approve, you know, and make sure we were on the right track. And so we called him on the phone and held the phone up to the studio monitor and just let the song roll. 
And me and Jim were looking at each other, like, you know, kind of remembering how we finished stuff, laughing, like, ah, oh, it's cool, remember, ah, oh, remember that, you know? And so after the song's over, you know, I go to the phone, and, you know, Florida to New York, a little bit long distance, so I hear this, I thought we lost a connection, because I had held the phone for the whole four or five minutes, however long the song is, so maybe at some point we got cut off. Well, Chuck, you there? And I hear this kind of choked up voice, you know, yeah, I'm here and stuff. Mm. What happened? He goes, nothing. I was listening to the song. I said, oh, you didn't say nothing. I thought you left, left off. And he goes, he goes, and I could hear him sound kind of like you're sobbing a little bit. I said, what's the matter, man? He goes, that was the best get well card I've ever heard in my life. And I just, right there, gave the phone right to Jim. <laughs> I was like, I'm out. I had to just, you know, compose myself because he was up there. You know, he's used to being part of the session. And I told him it's the first time I, in my life I've ever been to Florida without him there. The first time. And not only was I just in Florida, but I was working on his record. And he wasn't there like he always is. And to hear him react like that, I just... When it's all said and done, what is left to really see? To be one to the night, now we are just yesterday. I just felt terrible. This is my friend that's in trouble, really bad trouble, and it's getting worse. And I really would like him to know, I'm sorry. Yeah. I would really, really like him to know how important he was to me as a human being. It was weird because he just always assured us that even though something scary and serious was going on, he always kind of had this assurance that it was okay, he was gonna go get it treated. And he actually did start getting better after that. And that's when we started working on uh, this, this follow up, you know, the second record. So much time had gone by from the recording of it, the patching of the bass tracks and all that, that he was busy writing. And he was ready for the next album right away. Because I had recorded bass in the middle of 99. And by uh, the next year, he had all kinds of new stuff. And he was working on it extensively with Richard Christie. I remember rehearsing and, and you know Chuck writing the second Control the Night album. And I just remember us being so excited for this second album. and. and Chuck was so proud of the music. We were so well rehearsed. I went in there and, and we did the drums in one day. And I remember Jim Morris too, looking at me and looking at Chuck and he was like, what, what's going on here? He was like, it was such, such crazy, unique, innovative music that, that Jim Morris was just, didn't know what to think of it. And all of a sudden it hit him again. So with this, album uh when man and machine collide he had taken home those for that reason he had taken home richard's drum tracks and put them on a little you know eight track uh digital hard hard disk recorder so that he could work on it at home and he wouldn't be sitting there at morris sound you know where every time is money of course that's what led to you know us having to extract all this stuff from that machine and all the other issues we've run into since but but that was the primary reason, is because he knew that he didn't have the, the uh, stamina, you know, or the endurance to play through the, the whole thing and do it in a timely fashion. So he just wanted to bring it home. There's a possibility of finishing an album. The amount of work that have to go into it is tremendous to do it right, which is what Chuck told me had to be done. My last conversation on the phone with Chuck was, I want you to finish the record if you can, but don't fuck it up. If you can't do a good job, don't do it. So at that point, I don't think we ever really came close. There was, uh, 
There was a brief moment where we had considered going to Italy and opening up for Metallica at the Gods of Rock Festival, which would have been the biggest show that, that Death had ever done. And Chuck literally waited until about the last week before canceling, you know, to make, to see if he could do it because he was having problems with his left arm. His whole left side was just, you know, he had no, no control of his motor skills. So he couldn't really count on it. And um, we rehearsed quite a bit, you know, to strengthen him up, but he would have good days and he would have bad days. Chuck's a fighter and Chuck had a really positive attitude about it. I mean, it's, I can't imagine how scary it is to go through something like that, but, and Chuck has the greatest family that anybody could ever ask for. They, they were always there with him and encouraging him and they were like, you know, we're gonna do whatever it takes. And I was constantly on the phone trying to find new doctors and we would travel and when one, one doctor would say, no, we don't have anything, that just meant to me that they didn't know what to do. There must be somebody. In my mind, there had to be somebody that knew what to do. And Chuck told me, I feel like I'm standing at the edge of a cliff with one foot off. And when he said that to me, I knew we just have to try everything. Um, I ended up uh, calling him, and he was already like really sick, you know, and so, uh, you know, I called him up on the phone just to say hi, and you know, he sounded terrible on the phone. It was really kind of heartbreaking, but we talked for a couple minutes, and that was about all he could do, because he was really pretty zonked out, you know, with everything that was going on. And I remember telling him for some reason about uh, the new Voivod album. I'm like, dude, you got to hear the new Voivod. It's insane. And he's like, oh, yeah, cool. You know, and uh, yeah. We did have this thing from uh, Make Them Die Slowly where uh, one of the, the uh, cannibals goes, Koangia, and the other one goes, Kwa. And so we got one of those in, in that last conversation. It was kind of a, kind of a weak Kwa, but he still did it. You know, I was like, all right, that's cool, man. And that was the last time we talked. And they did one more Hail Mary pass. And that was, there was a, a drug and it was still at an experimental stage. And they really didn't know about dosing at the time. And they agreed to take the risk as a last ditch effort to save his life. So when we got back to Florida, and he could barely walk, and we went right into a hospital. And then I showed him the pretty little pamphlet they gave me with a pretty flower on it. And they were like, oh God, it's a, a trial. The Nobody could blame anybody because at that point, working with this drug was really the only possibility, uh, as remote as it was. And, uh, and I think that when they knew that it was over, I think they decided to take him home. And they took him back to Citrus and he passed away within an hour of being at home. That band, was, as far as I'm concerned, was responsible for expanding, breaking out of that closed box where, you know, if it's death metal, it had to be, again, had to be brutal all the time. And I think Chuck is, is, is largely responsible for that, of having the balls to want to do something that he wanted to do and not conform to what everybody else thought he should be. You know what I mean? 
And that, that, is, that is the testament to a true musician and somebody who um, follows his own path and not caters to what he thinks other people should think death should be or you should be like this or you should play, you know. And somewhat of, there's a lesson in there for all of us, you know. Keep wanting to do better because you never know when you're not going to have a chance to do anything else ever again. So he is a great example of growth. If you want to know the guy, listen to the guitar playing. Because that's him talking to you right there. That was the guy. To me, the best musicians I've worked with are the ones where you you hear them in the notes. You hear them, and you can. And I think that's where you get the real personality of the player. Look, mm -hmm. if you like certain styles of death metal, or if you're partial to the early brutal stuff and you don't really care about the progressive stuff, um, fine. But to say like to say death wasn't a death metal band up until the end is just silly.